friend. Vincent Price, eccentric, charming, a little over the top. Throughout his career, Vincent was thought of as the master of camp horror films. Though he generally played the heavy, Price always managed to do it in style. While his reputation primarily stemmed from the horror film, he had a very wide range. He could suggest a European, an Englishman, and at the same time, he was, of course, at home in a Western. But just who was the real Vincent Price? The answer might surprise you. On this episode of Mysteries and Scandals, we'll uncover the true horrors of the gifted actor who was hopelessly misunderstood. Oh, there are so many misconceptions about Vincent. I think people, I mean, he's so stereotyped that people probably thought that, you know, he lived in this big, dark, gothic mansion. He also had many little demons that bothered him. It's his constant fear, lifelong, that he would be broke. We'll also examine the witch hunt that almost ended Price's Hollywood career. He was the whole McCarthy era. I never really understood how he went from doing these wonderful roles to suddenly uh, working where we were working. And we'll see how Price was lured into one of television's most notorious controversies. He got embroiled in the whole scandal, um, as did all the quiz shows. It was a very bitter thing for him, I think. And uh, he was extremely angry about it. Oh, I promise you that this will be an interesting half hour with its full share of shocks and surprises and intrigue and, yes, spice as well. You said it, Vincent. Watch as we pry open the coffin on one tail from the crypt you won't want to miss. Vincent Price. Hollywood careers go, Vincent Price was one of the lucky ones. From the 1930s through the 80s, Price did it all. He worked on stage and film, television, and in print. The guy even peddled his own collection of artwork at Sears. But for all his varied accomplishments, Vincent Price is best remembered as the master of gothic terror films. Comedian Joan Rivers was one of Price's close friends. The public misconception about Vincent Price is he's a horror actor. An actor did horror films. Ah. Oh my God. The truth is, only one-third of Vincent's more than 100 films were horror picks. Still, fans had a tough time separating the real-life Price from his sometimes sinister big-screen persona, television personality Melissa Rivers. The man that was on screen, you know, followed the House of Usher and all these creepy movies, had nothing to do with the person. Let me see your face. Actor Christopher Lee. We've all got secrets. We've all got things we've done which we shouldn't have done. And we've all got stories in our lives which we don't want revealed, if you like. I'm sure Vincent's no exception. Surely after all these years, I'm entitled to a few small amusements. James Parrish is the co-author of Vincent Price, Unmasked. Vincent was born on May 11th, 1911 in St. Louis. He was the fourth child of Vincent and Margarita Price. They were extremely well-to-do. They were part of the pillars of the society in St. Louis. As a kid, Vincent had a hard time fitting in. His son, Vincent Barrett Price. As the last child, and as an almost freakishly tall child, I think that sort of separated him out from his surroundings and his peers, really. So he was always kind of the guy outside. But the 18-year-old outsider found his click when he entered Yale University in the fall of 1929. Price's daughter, Victoria. He kind of becomes involved in the drama department there, and that's it. He kind of gets bitten, really, for good. And, and he starts writing to people, and he says, do you think I could be an actor? Do you think I could go to New York? And they're like, oh. <laughs> Not a chance. So he decides to go to art history school at the Courtauld in um, London. Though art remained Vince's great passion, he couldn't shake his dream of working in showbiz, and his dream came true. After a brief stint on the London stage, Price returned stateside. In 1935, Vincent co-starred with Helen Hayes in Victoria Regina, which proved to be a tremendous hit. Vincent was lauded as the great new discovery on Broadway. 
actor Norman Lloyd co-starred with Vincent. It was very unique for a man to score that big a hit overnight as Vincent did in that part. He became a kind of matinee idol. And the leading man soon found his leading lady. He met Edith Barrett, who was a Broadway star. And uh, they fell in love and were married at St. Thomas's Church. The two tied the knot in April of 1938, but marriage took a back seat to Price's career when Hollywood came calling later that year. The 27-year-old actor made a string of films for Universal Pictures. But the fact of the matter is, is he's, he's not leading man material in his acting style, and he knew it. He took four or five parts where he was second, third, fourth lead in, in sort of second leading man roles or character roles and really realized that he had to change his persona. So in 1941, the actor headed back to the Great White Way with his wife and their one-year-old son, Vincent Barrett, in tow. While playing a conniving murderer in the hit play, Angel Street, Price found his theatrical calling. Audiences loved him as the villain and he thought, that's it, this, this is my thing. And he would play these sort of sensitive artistic souls who would for some, you know, reason had been pushed into a life of evil. And he was a sensitive artistic soul. And so he kind of channeled all of that into his villains and that's why it worked. <laughs> my mind is all right. It's not all right, Mrs. Stewart. Your mind is sick and it's getting worse. <gasps> You're losing your mind, Mrs. Stewart. The revelation was a major turning point for Price. He returned to Hollywood to co-star in the film Laura. You're Laura Hunt, aren't you? Yes. I'm Shelby Carpenter. Want to dance? I'm not alone. Oh, you poor girl. I bet he still does the polka. Yes. But just as things began to click for Vincent professionally, you guessed it, his marriage to Edith Barrett fell apart. After several separations, the couple finally called it quits in 1948. But what's that they say about a Rolling Stone? By the time he was divorced from his first wife, he had already met uh, wife number two, Mary Grant. She originally came from South Wales, had been on Broadway working as a costume designer. Vincent and Mary were married in August of 1949. Life was pretty good for the Prices, at least for a while. When we come back, Vincent Price gets burned in a Hollywood witch hunt and defends his honor in one of TV's biggest scandals. I'm Vincent Price, and you're invited to my party in the house on Haunted Hill, where so far the ghosts have murdered only seven people. So won't you come and make it eight? After years of playing supporting roles on stage and screen, 41-year-old actor Vincent Price decided to try something different. In 1952, he was cast, or should that be typecast, as the murderous yet sympathetic lead in the 3D horror classic House of Wax. For better or worse, the film sent Vincent's career in a whole new direction. He realized that the crucial ingredient was villainy, was evil. It gave you something to play. So he became sort of this dark, handsome man. My poor dear Claire, don't you know I wouldn't dare trust you? But beginning in the summer of 53, Price had trouble getting work of any kind in Hollywood. Soon after Vincent made the movie House of Wax, he was involved in being gray-listed in the film and TV industry because of his sympathies as a very liberal person with pro-communist affiliations. The House Un-American Activities Committee was in the midst of a witch hunt for communists in Hollywood. Anyone who was thought to be a commie sympathizer had the name put on a list and studios were advised not to hire them. After nearly a year of unemployment, Vincent caved in. He started to panic. Uh, under the pressure of the House Un-American Committee, his statement was made uh, rather privately in a letter, almost was an apology to the committee, saying that he thought anyone who took the Fifth Amendment was bad and evil, which was quite a contrast to the public Vincent, who was sort of befriending and supporting people who stood out and stood up to the uh, committee. Price was forced to betray his own principles in order to pay the rent. It was a tough decision, but it worked. In 1955, Vincent was cast as the slave master in Cecil B. DeMille's epic, The Ten Commandments, with Charlton Heston. I only worked with Vinnie once uh, in Ten Commandments. He was a, a joy to, to share a scene with. I guess that's the way I'd put it. The Ten Commandments put Price's career back on track. Eager to take whatever roles came his way, Vincent began appearing in a string of camp horror films, such as The Fly, what if Philippe does not have the mind of a human? 
but the murderous brain of the fly. Then he will have to be destroyed. Producer, director, Roger Corman. People have said that Vincent becoming a horror star was a mixed blessing. It helped him in that it revitalized his career. On the other hand, it probably limited some of his opportunities. And I've been very busy, but I'm back now. <laughs> But hey, work is work. Still, Price may have been experiencing some of the effects of the ongoing Hollywood witch hunt. Actor Dennis Hopper. Vincent was doing all the horror movies there. But I, I wondered how he had gotten to that level, because I, I didn't consider it a very high level. But it was the whole McCarthy era. I can't kill a gift. Between films, Vincent continued to pursue his love of art, traveling the world to lecture and search for interesting and exotic pieces for his collection. He really did have this deep belief that art could help you live a happier life. Vincent got to put his expert knowledge to use when he was asked to appear on the hit quiz show, The $64,000 Challenge, in 1956. I think the whole country watched him. He gave, a, he gave America a new appetite for art. What great artist designed the incomparable bell tower in Florence in 1334? Giotto. Giotto is right, for $1,000. This $64,000 challenge was really the big show, and he did very well. And then they asked Vincent to come back again. Then, after they finally ended the show, two years later, all of this came back to haunt Vincent. A disgruntled contestant went and blew the whistle to a congressional committee and told them about all the quiz shows that were faking things and giving answers to the different uh, contestants. And so an investigation came underway, and one of the shows and people involved was Vincent Price. Uh, he came under a lot of the limelight and a lot of the glare. Basically, Vincent was accused of being fed the answers before the taping of each show. It was a very bitter thing for him, I think. And, uh... He was extremely angry about it. Mostly it was uh, one instance where he had one answer initially and then was directed during the prep session that perhaps a different direction might be the right answer. He was exonerated. He got a lawyer and uh, he basically, you know, proved that he knew his stuff. Yet another close call for Vincent Price. You know, for such a nice guy, Vincent sure had his share of trouble. When we come back, Price's career takes a very sinister turn as the actor teams up with one of literature's darkest denizens. Do you know where you are, Bartholomew? You are about to enter hell. At an age when many actors are winding down their careers, 50-year-old Vincent Price was just hitting his stride. The 1960s saw a rebirth of Price's big screen image and a new birth at home. In 1962, uh, Vincent suddenly became a father a second time. His daughter, Victoria, was a surprise. Ironically, just when he hoped that he could be a good father, stay at home, his career blossomed yet again. Around the same time, Price hooked up with producer-director Roger Corman. When I did the Fall of the House of Usher, the first of my Edgar Allan Poe films, Vincent was my choice from the beginning for Roderick Usher because I felt that he was an intelligent, classic actor. For hundreds of years, evil thoughts and evil deeds have been committed within these walls. The house itself is evil now. He regained some of the box office power that he had had earlier and it was something of a renaissance of his career. We did a five, six, seven films together. So now here suddenly Vincent, at age 51, 52, was becoming a new star, and Corman was so happy with this that they started making one after the other. The Raven, The Pit and the Pendulum, Comedy of Terrors, and each one seemed to do better than the next. And the apex of the series, for many, including Vincent, was The Mask of Red Death. It had the most atmosphere, the most use of color. In the Poe pictures for Corman, Vincent soon discovered that to give the picture that extra added zest and to give it some flavor, he needed to go a little bit over the top. While we were up here mourning her, she was alive, struggling to be free. I'm going to torture you, Isabella. 
I'm going to make you suffer for your faithlessness to me. <laughs> you hold it! He was able to play these parts with that, I suppose tongue-in-cheek is the word really, but it was meant to be. It was a master of comedy. But it looked like this master of comedy was becoming the master of schlock. By the mid-60s, they started putting him in everything from a beach party picture, where he made a campy guest appearance, to a series which lasted for two entries called Dr. Goldfoot. Ooh. A wonderful explosion that destroys not only my love bomb, but their victims as well. He was acting in a lot of junk, and he just did it with a sense of merriment and joy and total hamminess. Mastery, God! Mastery! Vincent did some films that were really awful. And the thing about Vincent in this regard that I always found unique was that he never got sullied by it. He was still Vincent Price. All right. Shut up. Vincent always saw the ridiculous side of everything. Vincent had the most wonderful sense of humor. Vincent had a way of charming all of his co-stars. You must trust me. Give over your will to mine. Which is exactly what he did when he met actress Carl Brown on the London set of Theatre of Blood in 1972. Carl was the most dynamic, the most vicious, the best looking, the most charismatic woman you would ever encounter. My father met Carl Brown and uh, he left my mother. It was hard on everybody. After 26 years of marriage, maybe you fall into a routine and along comes this person and you just go. I think uh, shifting family to family was very difficult for Vincent because Carl uh, was not a loving stepmom. I think it was very hard for Vincent because he adored his children. And I know that Carl was, Carl was jealous, actually. After a steamy affair, Carl Brown became the third Mrs. Vincent Price in October 1974 and only death could tear this couple apart. Straight ahead, the king of horror mixes it up with the king of pop, but it's Price who winds up singing the blues. Dr. Vibes, who samples the finer things of life. In his own inimitable way. In the 1970s, film actor Vincent Price took his talent for terror to the small screen and became an icon to a whole new generation. He turned up on Batman, playing the egghead. He'd be on Fantasy Island, the Brady Bunch. You turned around, you'd see Vincent on a quiz show, a talk show, a cooking show. He was everywhere. He was afraid, this is my last job, I'll never work again. But Price was always working. The actor would say yes to practically any job. Tonight, I would like you to meet my next victim. Many would go out and just work. Carl was the one that would say, wait a second. Make them pay you. When Quincy Jones and Michael Jackson asked him to do Thriller, they thought, oh, great. He never thought it would turn into the big deal that it turned into. Thomas Silliman is the director of an art gallery Vincent founded in East L.A. And he says, Tom, I just got back from recording the record album of Michael Jackson. It's really cool. He put it on, you know, and he, 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 was, he was dancing around like that. I started dancing around with him. Here, I was dancing with Vincent Bright, or Michael Jackson, you know. <laughs> but Price wasn't exactly thrilled when Jackson's record hit the top of the charts in 1982. It turns into the biggest selling album of all time, and he never saw a penny from it. Finances were the least of Price's problems when in the fall of 1989, the 78-year-old actor was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. His wife, Coral, was also ill with cancer. He, he hated it. He hated the idea of being, of being ill and, and incapacitated. Price made his last movie the following year with director Tim Burton. Hollywood is not very nice to anybody. Vinnie wasn't working the way he used to work. He was getting older. Uh, Tim Burton was doing Edward Scissorhands, and he wanted Vinnie... They had planned one day shooting, and it took something like two and a half. And the executives came down, and there was a scene on the set 
with Burton defending Vinny, but Vinny knew it, and it crushed him. The film turned out to be Vincent's swan song, and in May of 1991, his wife Coral died of breast cancer. Her death was devastating to Vincent. I think after her death, the aging process sped up. Price hung on for two more years and died on October 25, 1993, from lung cancer and complications from Parkinson's disease. The actor was 82. At his request, Price was cremated and his ashes scattered in the Pacific Ocean. The thing that I loved about my dad and the thing that everybody loved about my dad was he had this incredible love of life. Vincent cast a long shadow during his lifetime. He was asked by somebody what he wanted written on his gravestone. And he said, I'll be back. The thing about legends is that they never really die. Vincent Price was a true artist who managed to shine through even the dullest of his movies. A real class act. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me the next time we take a look at the men behind the myths on mysteries and scandals. I must have that painting, Freddie. Once I had an, a, an original Utrillo and once I had an original Gauguin, but I, I, I have never had an original Da Vinci, and I must have that painting. I must, I must, I must. I must, I must, I must.